You're listening to the Gold Squadron Podcast, your home for X-Wing discussion, strategy, and entertainment. This is episode 60 of the Gold Squadron Podcast. I'm your host, Dion Morales, and today I am joined by Gold Leader Ron Longy. Welcome back. Long time no see, everybody. The Dice app works with... What? What? Too many letters, Nate. Version Nate's two. here. Version two. Nate's here. Whatever. <laughs> Get over yourself. <laughs> you and your dice app. Dude, the um, dice app like to save the day. Yep. And yep. William, I can hold it. Hegwood. What? What? What are you going to hold for us today? Um, I don't know. We'll find out. Do you hold my heart? I, I maybe. All right. I'm just going to mute you, Nate. Stop being weird. Getting weird, just weirdness, all the weird. Anyway, um, I hope you all are doing good. Today we're going to be talking about, of course, the World Championships. We just came back from uh, a few of us played, a few of us didn't. Uh, some played more than others. <laughs> and we're also going to be talking about X-Wing 2.0 because we haven't had a chance uh, to really break it down um, with, uh, with Ron and Nate. So um, we're going to be doing that. And just to remind everybody, we have live sh- three live streams a week that we're putting on right now. Uh, we have our Wednesday night league play, which we're going to be working on providing some X-Wing 2.0 content very soon with that. Our Friday night grab bag, basically whatever Dion wants to do on a Friday with the stream. I might be playing Knights of the Old Republic. I might be practicing X-Wing or making like, YouTube videos or something like that. Um, just whatever whatever feels good that night. And also, if you're watching live, our Monday night podcast live. So go ahead and join us if you're not watching live. It's a good time to interact with the show and ask questions live so that we can address them uh, right on the spot. Ron. If you, if you play Knights of the Old Republic on stream, can Andrea and I join you? It's not the it's not the MMO thing. It's like the old old one. Ooh, the good Xbox. one. Xbox. Yeah. Ooh. Dude, oh, uh, we can't play together, but all right. Yeah. <clears throat> but you know what? I probably should learn how to play that game. You should considering it's free to play. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah, you yeah, up to level 50 you can play it completely free. All right, I'm going to have to have to look into that. All right, gentlemen, so I want to take some time and talk about our experience at Worlds. Um, lots of stuff happened. We were there since, what, since Thursday, uh, Wednesday night for some of us, and uh, a, a lot went down. Um, Ron, I'll have, I'll have you start. Uh, you know, we have basically three categories to put here on the notes. You know, what are some people that you saw there that you want to maybe shout out? Um, you know, but... Give us, give us your, your world's experience. Yeah. So, um, this was, uh, what my fourth or fifth worlds. I've been to every worlds, um, uh, since, uh, the first one, um, I did show up on Tuesday night about, I want to say 10 o'clock. Um, I went to the FFG event center. I registered, there was a whole bunch of people playing star Wars, the LCG practicing for their tournament on Wednesday. The Star Wars LCG was actually the only ticket that I was able to get my hands on, despite all you wonderful people trying to help me out at Gold Swatcher get me a ticket for X-Wing. But that's okay. I came. I um, saw so many friends. Um, I ran into people that I used to judge with. I ran into players. I ran into all the FFG people. Um, one of the guys I play Star Wars LCG from France, it was great. Um, I was only there though until Friday because Andrew and I had a wedding to go to in Houston. So my experience for the most part was playing in the final world championship for Star Wars, the LCG. I ended up going six and six, which was great considering I played against last year's two time world champion, Mick Kipra. And I actually almost beat him in one of our games. And I also played against the runner-up from last year, um, Andy Hornsby, 
who, again, I almost beat him. Both times I almost beat them with my dark side deck. But um, they ended up did sweeping me in the end. So I ended up going 6-6, six and six, 500. Not the greatest record. But there was only 54 players, and all of them were very, very, very good because what's left of that game is really only the diehard players. That's kind of I'm sad glad. because it seems like, you know, that I, I've seen you, you're like, you know, how emphatic you are about this game and how good you say it is and everything. It's just sad that it's kind of winding down now. Yeah, I mean, the thing with all games is they all have a shelf life. Um, there's only one game you know, that I can think of that just doesn't have a shelf life, which is chess, but pretty much every game has a shelf life. It was a good time. Just there's too many star Wars games out there for competing for people's dollars. And X-Wing is one of them. Um, Destiny is another. And those two seem to be the, the have the strong foothold. Now Legion's coming out. We'll see what that does, but it, it's it's hard when you're when you're a fan of Star Wars. There's not many games better than X Wing, so it's going to be hard to compete for a dollar in um, in a tabletop game, especially with 2.0 coming out. Cool, Nate. Um. Oh man, there were so many like good times and everything here. It was. I gotta say, I've only ever been to two worlds, and this one was just amazing. The amount of people that we got to see and talk to and hang with. Um, I never got to really meet the Minox this year, and I got to meet D and Ryan, and they were really fun and nice guys. Um, there were just there was like a uh, one of the standout people that uh, I want to say was really funny and hilarious was uh Mark Tippett, who um found a way to get the entire group of uh, X-Wing people to sing a happy birthday song to our friend uh, Joshua is because Josh was there. Um, but he uh, asked his son, he's like, it was his, it was his son's birthday uh, for that day at worlds. And he asked his 11 year old son, he's like, Hey, I'm uh, worlds is this day. If you don't want me to go, that's okay. I'll stay and hang with you on your birthday. And he said, no dad, that's fine. Go. And so he sent him this giant video of everyone in the room singing for him. Um, the other funny thing that was really good too was that Mark Tippett decided uh, he was uh, zero and five, and then he got a buy for his sixth game, and he went up and complained to Flight Control for about twenty to thirty minutes because he wanted to go with zero and six, <laughs> and he was angry about the buy, and he demanded someone to play him. He's like, "Who are you? Get one of those people to come play me. I wanted the golden sombrero." And then they were like, well, Bar um, sir, you know, most people don't complain about the buy. But don't you understand? I need someone to play me so I can lose because then I'm dyslexic. And then that means it's 6-0 and oh, and I get to come back tomorrow. It's like, sir, I don't think that's how it works. Yes, it is. It was hilarious. Mark Tippett. He's an awesome guy. He's awesome. And so there are more amazing things. Um, there is an instance where... Um, uh, there are two players who are kind of arguing about um, how to deal damage for a harpoon missile, and uh, Chris Chico Brown uh, was trying to like you know, explain it to them, and um, one guy got kind of aggravated and said, "Well, we want a second judge to kind of you know explain this to it." So Chris says, "Oh, okay, we'll just get Frank over here." And Frank, of course, comes up, and you know he's always happy. And you know, uh, if you don't know who Frank is, he's one of the developers of X Wing. And they're trying to ask him about like this con condition with Harpoon, and he just kind of goes, "Yeah, y y you know, y you got damage, right? You're, you're you're good. I mean, you didn't know what you're gonna get anyways. You're dealt a random face up card, and so you could just tell that he's totally checked out and done with dealing with harpoons right now. So, and William. Uh, I also gotta say the the everybody that I met over the weekend, um, everybody was uh, super positive and just trying to have a great time. Uh, the uh, definitely notable. I was hanging out with the uh, the OCX guys, uh, Coach and uh, Chico, um, pretty much the whole weekend. Those guys were like hanging out in the parking lot. Uh, just uh, definitely the the friendliest people. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, their tailgating party was awesome. I mean, like Josh and Mark and Tyler. Thank you guys for like yeah, the, uh, uh, hold, holding up the standard of uh, just welcoming and being super nice. Uh, so big, big shout out to them. And Saint, I actually went out and sang karaoke with them Wednesday when I got into town. Um, they, it was just a, a riot. It was great. Um, 
Uh, also, I, I had a great time Thursday. Uh, while you guys were playing, uh, running the stream, trying to do my best. Hopefully that works out, Dion. Uh, um, I've been I've been watch, I've been going through the the footage and starting to edit it. it. Looked good to me. Sounded good to me. Okay. Okay. I never. Um. I'm always super worried about uh the the mechanics of it all. <laughs> so hopefully uh works out. Yeah, um, but yeah, I had a great time. I was gonna say there's only one mistake that you made. There's only one, and it's oh. super easily fixed. Is that in the bottom oh. left you didn't change the round number? Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't realize that until <laughs> uh I. I was so focused on the games that we didn't even check that uh, until like, uh, I don't know, like round five or something like that. We finally yeah. realized that I, I, I finally learned the system enough that I could figure out how to change that because uh, I couldn't figure out how to run. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Me and Kevin figured out how to run the, the boxes, the little numbered boxes. And yep. uh, I was real impressed that we even could figure that stuff out. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I didn't realize, I mean, I, I know that you do, uh, amazing job all the time on the stream. So, um, we were just, I was just trying to be as good as you, Dion, um, while doing it. Dude, it. man, just, just the fact that you stepped up to do it, uh, is huge. So no big deal. Just in editing, I just put a box over it and it says round two and nobody knows. So there only, only it, people who listen to the podcast will know that it actually didn't say round whatever it said. It said something else. It said round one for a while. <laughs> well, if that's if that's the only mistake, then um, hopefully it. Um, that's it, man. That, Everything sounded good. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, I mean, uh, the other notable thing, some some I'll never forget is definitely uh, the Goldies uh, hanging out in that tiny room. Um, <laughs> and just have, have so so many people just having a great time. Um, oh yeah, that that that's unforgettable for me. That was like that was such an amazing moment. Just I, that was the other reason why I thought this was. I was just so proud and so happy that this community, the X Wing community, is so tight knit and so kind of just awesome that we just like hang out with each other, having fun, and the culmination of the Goldies and just everything else just kind of showed how awesome this community is. And I just have to thank everyone for just being who you are and being a part of it. And just awesome. I, I don't know what to say. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the Goldies here in a minute. Um, as for, as for people, um, it, it's always amazing at the world championships to go and meet the people who are from overseas Cause you see them online. Like I, I talked to quite a bit of the international players through Vassal and, um, and on Facebook and just to, to put a face to these names that I know, um, and, and just to be able to spend some time with them and, and get to know who they are as people. Um, it's pretty amazing. Uh, all, all the guys from, from team Europe, uh, it was great to meet them, and and there's uh, guys from Australia there. Uh, the Icelandic just, guys, yeah, the Icelandic guys. I mean, there's, it's it's amazing. Um, and, and you know, something that we don't, I think we sometimes take for granted the fact that we speak English is that all these people from different countries come to us in the U.S. and and they learn English because that's what i guess the most uh, there's i don't know why right for whatever reason that has become uh like a like a standard right like you need to yeah. speak english and we we don't have to deal with the whole you know <laughs> having to to learn how to speak polish or or dutch or french or anything like that so um the the work that they put in just to be able to communicate with us i just, i always just think that's amazing for the non english speaking countries yeah, I had to play against a Brazilian guy, and we 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 had some issues like speaking, but like it was just you know it was kind of nice and wonderful, and um to kind of play with someone from like another country and just enjoy it together, kind of. Yeah, it's it's awesome. Um, I want to talk about the streaming now. Uh, we streamed on, like William said, we streamed on Thursday and Friday. And Saturday, um, most of it went went off without a hitch. There was a couple of. Um, it was interesting. My my phone had an update in between uh, Thursday and Friday, and once I updated it, like the internet worked like a mi a million times better. It was interesting. Um, 
whatever. We were, so we were on mobile internet. The FFG internet was, um, didn't, it had zero upload speed. So, uh, thank you to all of you guys who did watch live. You guys are awesome. Um, thank you to everybody who clicked that Twitch prime button. I know that it seems like, you know, it just takes 30 seconds and, and it seems like nothing, but everybody who took the couple minutes to do it, it really adds up. And, uh, just remember do it every 30 days. It makes a big difference. Um, over time. Yeah, I was really happy, man, especially, I mean, William, I don't, I didn't, I've obviously I didn't watch your games yet, but on Thursday, on Friday, when I was streaming and on Saturday, every single one of the games that we streamed were like top notch, like players, nobody got curb stomped. Like it was, everybody was always in it all the way up into the end. Like it was, it was, uh, it was probably one of the best, set of games that I've ever commentated on. Um, it was a lot of fun. And then when it comes to the final, we, uh, <laughs> William and I, uh, we, we commandeered the, uh, the, uh, the commentary. We, we set up a camera, uh, really high on top of a table and, uh, and pointed it down so we could see the, the, the final table. We zoomed in and, we gave commentary on the final. So that was really fun. There was a lot of people who wanted it. So thank you for the encouragement. We went ahead and did it. And, um, that is actually, no, no, that one's not live yet. It's that one's on the way. I'm also going to actually take the FFG video and splice in our audio with it. So that should be, uh, that'll be interesting (laughs) to do. And I want to talk about the goalies. Um, there was some people who couldn't make it, whether because they didn't make it to Worlds um, or whatnot. If you were nominated for a Goldie, you're, um, and you could find out the winners and all the nominees on our Gold Squadron podcast website. That's up there. I want to take a second and talk about the raffle. Um, that was a lot of fun. If you bought online tickets, um, what we did was we at at the goldies we had uh darwin and brandon and uh and omar were were like setting out everybody's tickets that they bought and writing the names on there so we're compiling all that information i'm going to be posting on the website all of the winners with their um you know with what prizes they won and stuff so that'll be fun but we did make a mistake and that is that when we were when uh, I was setting up the room and when the guys went up to get the prizes, we forgot about all of the art. Like, <gasps> no. Yeah. We left it all in the room. It was in between. Originally it was on the table and we thought, Oh, let's save some space. And it got put in between uh, like the dresser and a table so that when you walked in and grabbed stuff quickly, you actually couldn't see it at all. Um, so what we're going to do is we have that art here. I'm going to pull more tickets. So it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. The, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to pull six more tickets and I'll post those online for the winners of, uh, of some of that art. The only thing I can't ship is the, um, is the canvas painting. We're going to have to figure out another way to give that away. Um, but yeah, so Six more raffle thingamajigs going. I didn't throw away any of the tickets uh, because we realized that pretty quickly um, But after the Goldies were done. So um, that'll be given away. Thank you to everybody who came. And the plan is for next year, um, I already talked to the Minox and Scum of Villainy and OCX, and we're going to combine forces to make it bigger and better. And uh, the second annual Goldies will be... Uh, an even more fun experience and uh, we'll actually make sure that the internet at the hotel crapped out on us. So we're going to work on some things for that. That's why the, the stream went out, but the recording of the, of the Goldies is out there already. So yeah, tons of fun. Um, yeah. Let's see what else we got going on here. But yeah, that's world is, is one of those um, experiences that, when you bring every, all these people together for the same purpose uh, and most of the people are having a positive time, it's, it's hard not to have fun. So thank you to everybody who we met over there. Love you guys. And I can't wait to see you guys at future future tournaments and events, even though I think Worlds now is going to be uh, invite only. 
So um, it'll be a little bit more difficult to get into, but um, I look forward to you know continuing to give you guys content and make everybody better and get as many people qualified for Worlds as possible. So that should be fun. Anything else you guys want to highlight about Worlds? Oh, I, I got something. Um, it was like, it was uh, um, b- basically day playing in day two. So I I went uh, four and two. So I got into day two. Um, and those uh, two of those games were just heartbreaking. I got matched up against Francois in the first round uh, of day two. So one of us was going to end up being four and three. And man, it, it was it was heartbreaking uh, playing that game. Um, or just a little like setting it up because uh we had we had talked about it before of like uh man it's gonna there's gonna be a lot of sad people tomorrow uh taking losses um and then i played against uh tim dugan who i t- commentated with the last game and uh same situation just like man why is it why has it got to be one of us you know what i mean like um one of one of us isn't going on, um, yeah. and me, me and Tim actually knocked each other out of the cut uh, by because uh, it was such a close game. Um, that uh, uh, yeah, actually, um, yeah, if I needed to kill both of his ships um, in the end, and he needed to kill both of mine, if if either one of us would have done that, um, we would have probably been into the top cut for sure. Uh, but. Um, just uh you know we didn't we didn't know it at the time but like uh so we were um, we were just fighting for points and made a really a really uh excellent game um uh so and all all of my games were really amazing it was a great time so my lineups were freaking crazy round one who do i have to go up against chris allen was he flying against the thing i hate the most fen ghost that was not fun but he did give me a charger for my dice app. I, I, I don't know why you guys are applauding for that. I thought that was amazing. Yeah, he gave me a cell phone charger for my dice app. So round two, uh, Miranda, you know, the 100 point Miranda. Round three, who do I play against? Andrew Bunn playing Fen Lothal. Round four, who do I play against? Tyler Burnett, Fen Lothal. Round five, who do I play against? Hassan, who was actually Imperial Aces, who knocked me down. Then round six, who did I play against? Ryan Farmer, Pelp Aces. I felt like I played some amazingly hard people. And somehow, like, uh, I was able to work it through. Round seven the next day, Andrew Schmidt, who, uh, you know, William Higwood knows very well, who is an incredibly good player, and um, I like to say got tied with, like, uh, William at, like, the Depticon. <laughs> so... It was just it was so incredible to play against all these people and it was really just like wow i can't believe i'm on the same stage as some of them and i thought that was awesome well thursday uh was a murderer's row i mean if you just look through the um like who was there on thursday i mean a majority of those names you go i don't want to play them 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 all of a sudden you get to the end you're like okay yeah this is <laughs> thursday was absolutely stacked um so there was a ton of players who, um, you know, who are great players who didn't make the cut because Thursday was an extremely hard day to go even four and two. So, um, yeah, it was tons of fun. Um, I, in the tournament, did not do very well. Um, it happens. I went two and four. Uh, but I played it out. So, yep. I could have gone three and three. But in the last game, um, in round six some the the stream was being weird and like we lost like one of the cameras so in in a rush to set up for my game like i went i fixed the stream and ran to the game i messed up my setup with the gunboats and they were just a little bit too close to the board edge uh and i in my opening i i do this bank towards the board edge and if i do it correctly which i've done 99.999 percent of the time it's fine. It's close to the boardage, but I know it's not off, but I didn't set it up right. I flew off the board and I was like, you know what? <sighs> it's fine. I can, I just conceded right there because in the, the matchup, there was no way I could, I could win without, uh, without that gumboat. So that's how, uh, that's how the tournament wise went for me. Um, yeah, but it was one of those where because it is, the, it's, it was the last, uh, the last 
first edition worlds. I didn't feel bad about it. It was one of those where, oh, that sucks, but it's okay. Like I, it doesn't, uh, in the long run, it doesn't mean much. So I just, uh, I lost out on my chance to, you know, make the cut and stuff like that and get some 2.0 templates, but it happens. Would have been cool to get some dice. But anyway, I think we need to, uh, we cannot go without saying a huge congratulations to Simeon de la Pina for becoming our, our, um, X-Wing world champion. world champion. Yeah, he uh, he took that control bot list, uh, which some people are starting to call Brit bots because it was it was a popular archetype uh, from pl- well, f- with players from Britain. Um, Jesper Hills is one of the probably mo- most notable people who have been flying it, and uh, he took it to the top. It is a it is a nasty list to play against, and uh, he flew it masterfully and was able to get all the way to to the final and win it. So congratulations! He's the youngest um, champion we've ever had, and it was if, if you have an opportunity to go back and watch the footage of when he won and how emotional his father got and how pumped they were. It was just super exciting to watch. Um. I, it was like I, I got I got jazzed doing it, and the 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 runner up was excited for him. It was, it was just a really good, um, g- good experience. It had that sports like feel. I'm looking forward to in the coming weeks. I unfortunately didn't have a chance to interview them on site, but I'm going to be reaching out and, um, you know, trying to uh, get some interviews for you guys and work out on. Uh, I'm getting getting some more exposure for for Simeon and and picking his brain on some things, um, as well as his squad mates and and see what what tidbits the do does our world champion have that can make everybody everybody better. Now here's something that we have to talk about. Every single world championship winning list has been nerfed pretty soon after it wins. How it let's uh, I know the 2.0 is coming out, but if if they were to to nerf the championship winning list, what would they do? And if you're not familiar with it, I'll just go through it right here. It's IG 88 B and C. If you're not familiar with their abilities, IG 88 B says after you perform an attack that misses, you can perform a uh, cannon attack afterwards so basically you shoot with your ion cannon and if it misses you just try again so you're trying to strip tokens and you know it's uh both of the bots are doing that you're trying to focus down one and walk it off the board it has tractor beams as well so you can try to put things like quick draw on a rock which we did see during the final um and then they also have advanced sensors rig cargo shoot and one of them has an ion bomb uh, they have the auto thrusters as well. And the nasty thing with the rig cargo and advanced sensors is that you can't be behind that IG-88 before he moves or after he moves. Because he can just, if, if you stay behind him and then he's, he activates, you just advanced sensors, drop the, the chute, and then move. So it's, uh, it's one thing, especially with the, po- I, I'm guessing that we're going to have a lot of people trying out these robots in the next uh, few months while 2.0. Oh, before 2.0 don't get behind them until like don't try to behind them is not a safe place you will get shooted so just uh just be aware of that so like yeah no we know that just like uh anytime like any build goes um and wins the the worlds and everything you see influx of people trying to do it but just like when nathan id you know was using corn horn everyone goes oh i'm gonna be good at corn horn and there's only a few people who are actually pretty decent at core and horn. Unfortunately, he takes a lot of finesse, but, and these robots are no different. They are PS six. They require so much forethought, thought, so many different things. And it's going to be kind of funny and kind of hard to watch people all try to do the same things that he and Jasper does, but that just ultimately won't be able to like mimic the same skill. Yep. Absolutely. So, um, congratulations to him. Congratulations to Yelte for being, um, the runner up. Um, I actually got to record 
two or two or three of his games on the Gold Squadron podcast stream with him playing um, Inquisitor Quick Draw in your, and his play is absolutely masterful. There was a couple of times during the game where like I was questioning his his moves, like I wonder why he's doing this, and then it ends up coming around and working out. Like it, it was just really great to see. He had a really good positioning, decision making, um, and showed just some really top play with both of those pieces. So if you want to, you want to learn about some positioning for Palp Aces, go ahead and watch those games. They'll be published here in the next week or so um, on our YouTube channel. And uh, I mean, he he just he he flew his ass off like he really did. And to be able to anticipate Simeon's moves, like the only reason why. Yelte lost in the end. I mean, they were they were both playing great. But if he would have been able to continue to arc dodge and do what he needed to do in the game, I think Yelte wins. But Simeon caught him one time. Caught him one time. And that's all it takes with a with he was stressed and ioned. And that was the, that was the end of the game because he was able to kill the Inquisitor and uh and that was it. But he was able to delay that uh that from happening by just some masterful moves and uh, just a big shout out to him because I, I learned a lot just watching his games. Uh, and I can't forget to say thank you to Fan Langalang for commentating with me on, uh, it was two games with me for those two games when his, uh, his squad mate was, was playing. That was a, uh, that was a good time. Oh, I do remember one other thing that I kind of liked about worlds this year. If you want to go into that at all, or sure, go ahead. All right. So last year, like, they had the new idea with the prize bowl, and you know there were parts of it that were interesting, parts of it that weren't that interesting, and I felt like it could have been done better. This year, when I first looked at, it, I'm like, wow, the inflate of the prices and everything is really super expensive. But then I realized what they did to kind of offset those prices is that they had so many hangar bays last year there weren't a lot of hangar bays going on so people felt like they kind of got gypped a little bit this year you could get pretty much whatever you wanted from that wall even if you got knocked out of cuts and everything by playing hangar bays and if you played destiny if you played um x-wing or a lot of the other things you found a way to get tickets and and you were able to come home with something or a couple things i saw a lot of people just farming destiny pods and coming up with a crazy amount of tickets were able to get everything their the hearts desired and i thought that was really cool how they kind of worked that in this year a little bit better it was actually a lot better yeah they were they were doing um like this um destiny pods and hangar bay pods so as soon as they they had like a sign up and as soon as they had uh six people ready to go they fired it off and you could as soon as you were done you could enter to get in another one so the only thing to stop you from playing hangar bait was time like just once you ran out of time in the day they would stop but they had them going constantly it was uh it was really great because people even if you got eliminated from the cut you had something to do which is uh which is important especially if you're if you go there you get knocked out day one well i you know i have my hotel room till sunday what do i do they had stuff uh, stuff for you to do i did not get to participate in any of the hangar bays because i was with you guys commentating mm -hmm. but uh i I love doing this, so it's uh, it was all good. Um, I'm trying to think. Wait, I would like go for it. I'd like to make one critique about that. No, we, and we know, Ron. Like this is really interesting. Go ahead. The uh, I thought it was a great concept for what they did with the uh, with the firing of the pods. Um, but like Nathan said, they did increase the ticket cost of everything, so. I would just, and this is not, this is just a, a positive critique. I would just like to say, I still think it would be a little bit better if they lowered the cost on some of the items, especially like the really big ticket items. Um, because while you guys were playing in the main flights, during that point, there wasn't a lot of stuff going on. The All the side events at the Radisson were in one place. And they uh, they actually couldn't fire pods quick enough when they were doing these on Wednesday and Thursday or Thursday and Friday. The waits for the pods were quite long in some cases. Like they were like they had eight people to fire the pod or six people, but the waits sometimes you waited for an hour or more 
just to be able to play because there were four or five pods ahead of you waiting to fire because they didn't have enough space. And everyone was scrambling to do as many of these pods as possible because the ticket cost was so high. Like, for instance, I played in the LCG and I got five tickets for every game I won. So I went six and six. So I got 30 tickets plus the 10 for participation. So I got 40. But then I did six pods of Destiny over the next two days. And I ended up coming away with 190 tickets. And that was only because I, first of all, I went very lucky. I went 15 and three in Destiny draft. Um, so that was a lot of tickets for winning and a lot of tickets for participating. Um, but one of the things that I noticed was all of these games in these side events were ultra competitive. And in the X-Wing community, I don't think that's really too much of an issue because so there's something about X-Wing community that's so great. Like people come, they play, they're there to have fun. Um, they're not really there to like monetize um, their experience. But like when I was playing the Destiny pod, some of them were a little bit uncomfortable because like I was doing well and I was winning and my opponents were getting very angry because they were under the stress of like, well, I really trying to get that 120 ticket item. And if I keep losing, it's just harder and harder to get. So I would just say I would like them to maybe curtail it back just a little bit. So um, there isn't this rush to do it and it's not super competitive. I mean, I felt the Destiny pawns were just as competitive people playing in Worlds. Like, everyone was running their best decks. You saw people get a little salty, a little angry when they were losing. And that is probably, like, the only thing that I would critique them. Does that does that sound fair? Oh, yeah. No, that, I, that makes sense. Um, I heard that there are some people who are, like, eight-person pods they'd go and like they get eight friends together and then like walk off, come back and be like, we're done. And then somehow split up all the tickets. I think yeah, they, that, got, they got like that, that quickly though. That happened a lot. Like they would literally eight people would sign up in a group and they would just decide who won. And then we'd come back and, and turn in the thing so they could go again. But again, this was all created because, because the, the high ticket items were so hard to get. Right. Like I played, like I said, I, pl I went 15 and three. So you get 10 tickets per win, 10 tickets per thing you played it. So I played it six spots. So I had 60 tickets plus 15 for winning. That was 210 tickets plus the 40 for um, my actual main event. There was far more tickets for me to get just doing side events than actually playing in the main event. Yeah. Which I also think is kind of backwards. Like I would feel like you want people to be more rewarded for playing in the main event than the side event. And I only walked away with three items because the big ticket items were so big. So I got a big ticket item for myself, one for my really good buddy back home, and then I got one other item, and that was it. There was a there was a lot of stuff there, but in comparison to last year, I felt like people were getting a lot of stuff, and there wasn't this stress about trying to get tickets to get stuff. Yeah, um, so I'm wondering now with, uh, this is a point brought up by Utah, um, UT Valley X-Wing, uh, considering that next Worlds is going to be, or for X-Wing at least, is going to be X-Wing only, I'm wondering if they're going to be able to fire off um, more, more hangar bay pods without people waiting around. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I um, I'm sure they. I'm sure they will. One of the things. One of the things about the side events, too, is that you know, once people realized that their dollar was worth more, their time was better spent in the side event than in the main event. I noticed people dropping from the main event earlier to jump in the side events because they realized, oh my gosh, if I just keep playing side events, I can get stuff off the prize wall. Yeah. Um, a lot quicker than playing in the main event. And I, I don't know. And again, when you make it really expensive, 
you're kind of monetizing the uh, the the prizes because mm-hmm. I don't know if you've seen some of the prices these these cards were going for. Like the Armada card went for like three hundred dollars. Which one? The just the spot gloss Armada card. The the Destiny card was going for the two fifty. I mean, so you really had like again really really heavy competition for these things because because they were so hard to get they brought a big price tag i feel bad i think if they armada people because how much how many games do they play for like to get what they need or what they want i mean holy crap those games take forever yeah i don't know i don't know i just i just think i would like to see a little bit it's just a a little bit of a strategy difference of not making the cards so hard to get that it creates a negative play experience for people who are there to have fun for far and foremost. That's all cool. Well, like, yeah, especially when people are just buying them just to resell them online anyways. I mean, that takes away the whole point of that. Like last year when I was trying to get the Boba Fett card, like a lot of people were sitting there with like two cell phones in their ears trying to like sell it and everything. I'm like, I just want it because I want to finish my collection. And people were just trying to like sell it for a hundred, 200, whatever I was going for then. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, there, there's yeah, I mean, the pri- the prize wall. It does I think no matter what, no matter no matter like, what the price the like how many tickets things cost, people will always try to sell things because that's what people do. Supply and sure. demand, yeah, yeah. Supply. But do you think? Do you think if maybe the if maybe it was easier to get, you know, like for you know just supply and demand, right? If you made it a little easier to get. Maybe a card only goes for fifty bucks. Then how enticing is it for you to go through all that work to get a fifty dollar card to sell? You're right. Versus well, a two hundred dollar card, a three hundred. Yeah. Well, I think card. maybe then it just comes down to what if FFG is trying to raise the value of the of the swag. That's one way they would do it. Just like because from from what I understand, FFG is staying away, at least for X Wing, from cash events. Like they don't please don't ever do cash events. Please do never never right never let, let me let me move on for that. So um so because they don't do that, the way that they can add some some monetary value to the prizes is making them harder to get. So then you you have that, um, you know, that uh, that competition there, right? And I'm, and I'm and that's my whole point. I'm not sure that's the best direction, and that's the only reason right. I bring it up. No, absolutely. I, I think I think we can all agree, right? Like all of us. I mean, I don't know, but I don't go for the to 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 monetize my trip when I go and I I'm looking at a get a swag. Mm-hmm. I'm not getting it to sell it. Like I, I wanted Hondo because he's one of my favorite characters from Star Wars Rebels, right? You know, and I got two of them, one for me, and I just gave the other one away. It was a two hundred dollar card. I just gave it away to somebody yeah. who couldn't come. So I don't. I think it just goes better all with our type of community uh-huh. when we are not incentivized to get things for money and to sell them because they have such a big price tag. I think if it was a $50 price tag, most people were like, I don't know. I worked hard for this Hondo. I'm going to keep right. it. It's only worth yeah. 50 bucks. People were offering me three, 150 to $400 for the world's dice I just got. And I'm just like, well, yeah, that's great. But I mean, man, I, I slogged through so many names, so many people to get to this. Oh, you let's, know, let's, I might, I might actually, these, don't tell the dice app. Don't tell the dice app. I said that. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, let's, yeah, move, let's on. move on. Yes. So, um, I think we, with this announcement of X Wing 2.0, we did do a a live show, um, right before Worlds. That I actually haven't even gotten. Like with all the things that we had to do with Worlds, I have not gotten that out yet. So, episode. This is we're recording episode sixty right now, but there is episode fifty nine in the tank. So we'll release both of them at the same time. I just have. I had zero time to to edit and do it all. Um, We've been busy, but uh, let's let's talk a little bit about X Wing 2.0 because we um, it was spoiled on the very first day of the whole world's thing on Tuesday. They had the live stream, and um, you know we 
we just got so much information. I was able to talk um, unofficially to a couple of people um, and got some some small tidbits and answers that were there that uh, about X Wing 2.0, and uh, I'm just extremely excited about a lot of the changes that are coming. And and Ron, I think um, I, I want to lead this conversation with you because let's let's be honest, right? I'm sure people noticed that you kind of faded out of the cast because X-Wing became one of those things for you that you weren't as excited to play. Am I right about that? A hundred percent. So, you know, um, I, I'm going to have you lead off since we didn't get your thoughts on it. You know, you heard X-Wing 2.0 was, was announced. You heard about all the things that they're going to do. What was your initial reaction? So honestly, my initial reaction was like tears of joy, honestly. Um, I really like X-Wing. Um, I love the idea that it's a very simple game with a massive depth of strategy. But as someone who was a game designer and someone that um, is always looking f- – I'm always kind of nitpicking and I'm trying to do it in a negative way, but I'm always trying to nitpick to how can I make something better. And for a while I was starting to lose a little love of X-Wing because a, it was difficult to play the ships that I really like to play. And B, I felt like there was a lot of mechanical issues with 1.0 that since going back all the way to wave two, through the fact we just kind of like band-aided all those things right like we would we we had an issue with turrets so like we gave auto thrusters and you know we had an issue with fat haunts we used half points and and i could go on and on on all the little things that we band-aided over time to to fix issues but as it x-wing kind of got to where it is now a lot of those band-aids were kind of stretching and the design space for them I felt like was non-existent. So I started to lose a little faith in what they were putting out and it didn't really interest me. So I didn't really think it was fair for me to be on the podcast talking about X-Wing if I wasn't actually playing X-Wing. So I kind of just took a step back and let all the guys in Gold Squadron who actually play like William, Nate, Marcel, all you guys, you know, come and talk about X-Wing. But 2.0, man, like almost everything that I kind of had an issue with in the game g- is getting answered. Um, fixing turrets. Um, I love the fact of the app where they can adjust points in real time. Um, I didn't even I know love, that you were doing that. I thought when I heard about that, I thought that was super cool. Yeah, and I, and I just – I love the idea of – you know, just cleaning up so many things that the game can really be fun for me again, personally. I love the idea of rewarding players for also playing um, ships in like a swarm. I like the idea of getting back to faction identity because as their design space shrunk, they started just giving every faction what the other factions had. It was like, oh, well, every you know, has TLT now, right? Every exactly that kind of a thing. The other thing that I really um, like about 2.0 is that I had a really good conversation with Frank about how when they cost things, it's not going to be like a simple cost scale. Where in 1.0, a new ship would come out. And you would hear it here on this podcast. We would anytime something new come out, we'd go over it, right? And like we would say, Oh, there's a two pilot skill ship, a four pilot skill ship, those are your generics. Then you've got your six pilot skill ship that has an ability, and your eight pilot skill ship that has an ability. Nine times out of ten, we would be like, Okay, here's your two, here's your four. We wouldn't talk about them because they didn't matter. Because the the way the ships were pointed out was, you know they would go up in scale based on pilot skill. And then there was no cost to take an effect for the pilot ability, which is what we would all analyze anyways. Now, according to Frank, like that is not how they're going to stat these ships out. 
like each individual ship's points is going to be based off of all their abilities. So maybe a generic ship will have an aggressive low point cost and you'll have to choose be, be, between playing more ships because they're really cheap and efficient versus one ship that has a really good ability. And that's that's what I missed. I missed having more ships on the table, blocking and arc dodging as a thing. And I think all of that will be back with 2.0. Yep, I'm, I'm super pumped. I mean, I uh, all the things you talked about. I, I remember <laughs> TLT is gone, and because and, and oh. because TLT is gone, auto thrusters is gone. Because auto thrusters yep. is gone, harpoon is gone. <laughs> because <laughs> you know, and um, you know, they just they made a lot of they they made a lot of small changes elegant changes that they they couldn't incorporate into 1.0 because in the end there was so much so many little things that needed to be tweaked that um that it was it was just too much to 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 just include in a fact and that was one thing that you saw um some complaints from people that it was like you know like oh man to play this game you got to you got to, you know, read 20 something pages of an FAQ and X, Y, and Z to know when things are changing and all this. Well, now with the, here is the, the thing I love about the points being able to be flexible is let's say they just they they put out this broken card, right? Like it's just it's just way too good. They no longer have to, like, change the text. Well, this card should now read this. They just price it out of un, like usability, right? They just like you know what? If you want to take this card, it's it's twenty. This one upgrade is is forty five points. Go ahead and try to use it, but it's gonna be you know almost uh, a quarter of your squad to use it. You know, like there's no need. That's why the abilities printed on the card now, like you can have those, and those don't need to necessarily be editable. I don't think we'll we'll enter a situation now where we have to have um, erratas on cards because if a card is too good and needs and would need an errata, they'll just they can just price it out of usability and then release a different upgrade in a future pack that does a you know a lower power level um, version of what uh, you know they they nerf or not nerf but they price out of usability. Does that make sense? No, that is exactly a sense. Like, if we all like, you could use use the X wing for example, right? I think we would all agree that the X wing's not an awful ship. It was just the first ship, and because it was the first ship, do you think we would have played an X wing at some point if we just dropped the X wing by what seven or eight points? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I think we would. One hundred percent. And now they have that power to do that. If they say, hey, you know what? When we look at worlds and you know how you say every world's, you know, something ends up getting nerfed or or it has happened where something's gotten nerfed. Maybe they say, hey, you know what? Swarm is just not on the table. Let's reduce the cost of all the TIE ships by one point or whatever it is. Maybe Swarm's available again. It, it just it gives them so much flexibility to react and also gives them flex- the ability to react quickly. We don't have to wait months because they're not putting out a document that has to be approved by LFL. That's a big deal. Like it's in the app. They just change numbers before when they would make an FAQ. We have to wait for everything on there because they're putting out a, a document that has to be LFL approved every time. What's LFL again for those of Lucas us? Lucasfilm Limited. All right, you're off the podcast. So, <laughs> and and when when, <laughs> when I talk to I when I talk to Frank and Alex about this and Max, um, their their deal their 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 update basically to their licensing deal is now they can change those numbers without submitting it, like because there there isn't. Um, there's no, um, there's no printed 
um, material to this except for publishing those numbers on their website. That's just like, all right, we they they publish the original, you know, document, and the, they're just editing a, a text field with the with the numbers now. So, um, they they said they're going to be doing regular updates, like you, they'll be scheduled. You know, maybe it'll be once a quarter or something like that. But like like we've we said already, they'll be able to do an emergency, like, hey, we we just noticed this, you know, edit that cost this much now, enter, it's done. Um, it, there there are some questions though, I think that arise with 2.0 that after the initial excitement, which is huge. I mean, I still am excited about it. I do have a couple questions about how um how the app is so for instance. I let's say I own an iPad and I have it on there. How does it get how do you know if we're playing with the same version of the app? So I think that's just one thing that um again, we don't we don't have the app in our hands. We don't know if the app um uh if if it uh what's the word I'm looking for? Uh if they collect you can connect app to app. I know one of my friends who plays it's either Warhammer or War Machine. Sorry if you guys play that game. I I I'm not super familiar with it, but when you play, it's part of a, a standard uh, procedure that you have your your list on your app and you connect them you like give each other a code and then you can see their their lists and it gives you all of the you know up to date information on there so i don't know if we'll have that capability with this x-wing app or if that's something they can add later um it might just be something as simple as like hey before we play let me double check what, what version of the app we're using oh, okay cool you know we're on the same thing I'm, I'm imagining that would probably just be on the the start screen you know version 2.6 updated this date yeah but like um the apps can update some of those things without actually having to like update the app itself so if you're worried about like oh this guy's got the 1.0 app and i'm on the 2.0 and using the old scores they can still fix that without you actually having to update anything yeah, so we'll 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 have to see. Well, like, so for instance, what if I download the app and I just disconnect it from the internet? How is it going to update? That's true. Right? Then you're also a jerk. Well, of course, of course, I'm saying <laughs> I update my dice app every time. Every time. That's right. Honesty is the best policy. <laughs> um. And then there was there was one issue. Now I I'm, I'm going to raise this argument simply to play a little bit of devil's advocate with 2.0. Um, and we were talking about the squad point changing with, um, you know, trying to balance the game. And I think it's, it's really important and I'm excited about that because it's going to bring diversity to the game and it's going to keep things fresh. And I think it's going to bring in... Uh, the the skill of list building is going to be more important than ever. I'm going to say with that. I, I'm pretty sure um, the, one of the the things that you would hear from a lot of people is, "Hey, don't worry about list building. Just you know, look to see what the best squads are in the meta and just play that." But with with the game constantly being rebalanced, we're not going to have as much time to figure out what is the best list in the meta, and because they are um they've taken a look at all these ships i mean it's like 40 something ships and they're they're just uh, they're they're flattening out that power curve you're going to have so many different options that i think um just like i said list building is going to be just vital and once you think you figured it out you know by that time that's when ffg you know drops the drops the update so we'll have to see so with this point changing um I had I had a, a really concerned uh, person uh, emailing me back and forth while I was at Worlds and just had this thought and was saying, "Do you think FFG would use these point adjustments to drive sales?" Now, while FFG is a business, right? They're here to make money, and yes, if you know if they drop costs significantly on, you know X. You know, let's say all of a sudden the quad jumper is just like, man, if you're not flying the quad jumper, you're wrong. Like this is the best ship in the game now. All of a sudden, quad jumper sales go up. I'm like, all right, now let's nerf it. And then you know that that was a concern that this guy has. Um, 
but I think, you know, people are always going to buy what's best. So I don't know if that argument is super valid. I agree with you. And I think even though the community at large can often, we can often, everyone can have faults with FFG. I don't feel like they would ever simply just drop the point cost on a ship just to sell it. They're not having a problem selling ships. They are having a problem making sure that the game stays balanced. So I feel their their only motivation to changing these ships would be to see balance. Like I said, if maybe there is a, a very iconic ship or maybe just a type of strategy that's not seeing play, maybe they adjust the points. You know, good example would be ordinance for for what the first four years of x-wing three years of x-wing ordinance did not even exist it was just not something anyone used simply because it was so over point costed and we had to get multiple upgrades just to make it so that it was too good well now they could just simply point cost it correctly and make it more in line of what it should cost as opposed to like putting out these upgrade cards to make a combo that's really powerful. And I think that's what you're going to see in point costs. I think you're going to see just more balance changes than, oh, you know what? We really we really got like a whole warehouse full of these Z95s. Let's just dump, make them low as they can go. People don't realize FFG doesn't warehouse their product. Everything comes off a boat to a distributor and gone. So they're never going to drop the points on something because they have something sitting in their warehouse. They don't have ships sitting in their warehouse. Yeah. And, and I, I wanted to just bring up this, this other, this, this view because this person was, was really adamant about it. And I said, you know, let's, let's bring it up. And I'm, I'm exactly where you are, Ron is I, I don't think that's going to be something that we see. Um, and if you're concerned about it, um, the only thing that will actually tell us is time. And the the issue is that if this is, if that was something that FFG started doing, I think the, com- the way the community is, um, I think FFG would get called out pretty quickly on it. Um, but I don't, I don't see it happening. You know, we're, we're the, the changes here are about balancing the game and making sure that people are still playing the game uh, in the long term. And like you said, Ron, they're not having any problems, uh, any any problems at all selling ships. And, um, you know, we've talked before about, like you said, they don't have warehouses, you know, full of stuff. It's just, that's, that's why things go out of print, right? And all of a sudden you can't find a ship because there's literally no more. <laughs> they they, yeah, they do it, enough to it's... fill their pre-orders and then a little bit extra to, to put them on the shelf and that's it. Right, and that's why that's why we can't get like these definitive dates where people are like, hey, I want to know when the next wave is coming out. And often in the articles, they say, oh, you know, quarter two, quarter three. FFG doesn't even know when these ships are necessarily going to come in on the boat. They place their order for print. They get on a boat. However long it takes them to get here, and then come off the ships. That's when you get the ships. So they really only know a few weeks before we get them in our hands. So the idea of them modifying a ship so they could sell more of a particular ship doesn't sound good. I mean, it doesn't sound like it's good for them in any way. Why Why would they particularly want to just order? That would mean they would have to order more ships because they of a certain type because they know they lowered right. the cost. And then a ship would go out of print. FFG doesn't want things to go out of print out of print and then have to reorder a single thing you know that they, they want these things to sell in waves so i just i don't see that as a valid concern in my opinion and i am one of those people who can be a negative nancy and i i'm telling you it's it's just i don't see it all right so um 
in the description when we post our our podcast episode and the and the video to all this, we're gonna put in a link. Um, um, somebody has done a wonderful job. We we started compiling a Google Doc of of all the stuff we could find, but we found somebody who basically had it finished already. They they found as many things from videos and interviews and all this stuff. We're gonna be putting this link in there because it is it breaks down so much of the information that we've seen, different pilots and cards, and um, what I want to do, I want to kind of go around the horn, around the horn here, real quick, and uh, we'll do this a couple times. And I want you to tell me from um, from what we do know from 2.0, what is something that you either find interesting or you're excited about, or just something that you want to bring up um, to the to our our listeners. I'll go. I'll go ahead and start, so you guys can can start looking through the document. William, you'll go next. We'll go Nate, and then Ron, and just kind of go in that circle. Um, one thing that we are going to have to be aware of is the new rules for barrel roll. So um, in episode 49, I actually had it wrong. Um, and after um, getting a, a clearer um, answer from uh, Frank and Alex and Max in person, um, when you start a barrel roll, right, you have to start from the, the side center line. You cannot start at the top or the bottom of the base. You have to start in the middle. So what that means is after that, once you lift the ship, you have only three parts, uh, three choices on that side uh, that you're barrel rolling. You can either go from middle to middle, you can go from middle to top edge, or middle to back edge. They did this for a couple reasons. The first reason is you guys oh you guys know that there's times when you you do a barrel roll and it doesn't fit and you kind of you didn't really start it on either edge and you don't know where you started. This gets rid of that problem because you always started from the center line from from where the barrel roll began. So you can always put it back if it doesn't um, if it doesn't fit in a certain way. And when you do um when you do um, the barrel roll forward, you're taking that center line on the template and you're lining it up with the back edge of the, um, of the base or the top edge. You have three positions on each side that you can barrel roll. And it's just what it takes away is it does take away a lot of that flexibility. And um, our team of guys has, has always been adamant that barrel roll is significantly better than boost in the game. And now what it does is because it has basically three solid positions that you can go, well, six, if you want to go take left and right, um, it takes away all those tiny permutations that you were able to get in first edition. So we got to start practicing with a new barrel roll um, and, and starting to, to visualize it better. One thing to note that when you do, uh, from the center line, and you barrel roll, and you go as far forward as possible, it gives you the same amount of distance as you would go from like taking the template on the back as far down as possible and like trying to uh, try to go as far back. It's the same distance there. It's just measured a different way in order to give more accuracy um, where the template starts and ends. So uh, that's my thing. William? I uh, really like... Uh it's the force powers uh having force sensitive be like uh, a special bonus thing um then the, the different possibilities of kind of like chaining up uh force abilities um i heard that there was a generic force user uh that's cool um there was a i think an inquisitor for the inquisitor's tie um i really like that that it is adding more kind of personality to the different people who fly it. Um, the I believe the I thought the droids got a different thing as well. So, um, they get like a calculate instead of a focus. A focus. See, that's cool. That's like um, giving more like lore and personality to the ships, um, and that's kind of the whole reason we play it because it's Star Wars and uh, getting that Star Wars feel out of each ship. Run. This is easy for me. Slave one, slave one, slave one. I love the fire spray. It's my favorite ship. It's always been overcosted. 
it always has felt like it just isn't good enough. There's so so many better ways to spend your points. But now I'm sure the cost is going to be a little bit better. I like the addition of boost. I will happily give up evade for getting boost. Um, it even has the reinforce action, which is, I'm, I'm assuming that's got to be better than evade. It gets downgraded to a medium sized base and it's scum only for flavor. I mean, what's not to like about the slave one? I'm, I'm super, I, I will probably play a slave one for the first couple months and just try to master my favorite ship. I have, I think, six slave ones, which is pretty crazy considering <laughs> they're not really playable at 1.0. They're pretty though, right? And the new model has yeah, has the movable uh, movable wings on the side. That's pretty cool. It does, what? yeah. Oh my God, so I have to buy more buy at least ones. one more. <laughs> oh, that's brutal. How many can I field in Epic 8? <laughs> Oh man! Oh, that, I might have to sell some of mine and buy some new ones. All right. Yeah, I'm pretty pumped about that. So uh, another another thing I want to touch on is um, Ion works a little bit different now in Second Edition. So um, if you're a small base, one Ion token Ions you. If you're a medium base, two, and if you're a large base, three. They clear at the end once you've been ionized. A big difference, though, is that when you do that one forward, it's a blue maneuver, meaning that it clears stress. And the reason they did this is they they do recognize that in the game, if you are stressed and ionized, that is, you 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 have lost the game right there. You have zero chance of saving your ship because you never become unstressed and you you lose all your actions. You're basically not even playing the game. You're not setting dials Correct. or taking actions. Exactly. You, 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 all your choices are gone. So, um, yeah, I agree. That's a great choice. I don't think you should ever just be locked out of making a decision. Yeah. So, um, and then I guess the the little side note is that now green maneuvers are blue maneuvers. They did that for um, number one reason is for colorblindness. Now on a dial, people who are color or red, green colorblind can recognize the difference between the two because the red will be um, part of their, their colorblind scale, but they'll be able to see the blue and recognize that it is different uh, as well as the white. So, uh, so yeah, um, different uh, changes in ion with depending on the base size. Will, um, I actually like that they changed the bombs. I heard that there's no more mines in the game because they're super weird. Um, that's not really like tactical dogfighting if you just drop in a bunch of bombs and mines. So I like I like that. I kind of like dial that back quite a bit um, because it really got away from the true aspect of the game. And I think actually the the like torpedoes are on par of what they should be. You get like built-in extra munitions. Um, and uh, I don't think either the torpedo that I was looking at spent the target lock. So hopefully that's uh, something that's consistent on all ships or all, all torpedoes anyways. Yeah. Um, there is that, uh, the new, what's the, what's the name of the phase? There's a phase in which you drop bombs. It's like system. Yeah, the system phase. So you get to know you get before you set your dial, like the person has to make a decision whether or not they're going to drop the bomb, and you get to see that right away rather than having the perfect information of where somebody goes and then saying, "Okay, I'm going to drop my bomb." So it's um, less perfect information. Um, I want to now transition into linked actions. I think um, one of the things that they they did in making the game uh, in second edition is they took all of these staples in X wing and, and, and said, all right, we see that people like to use these cards, but it ends up locking ships into a certain, uh, you know, if you have boost, you automatically have auto thrusters, right? Like no, no matter what, like, there's all these things that y- you kind of follow these rules. You know, every, you know, a wings, interceptors, um, the, the silencer, if you don't put PTL on it, you know, you're, you're wrong and all these things. Um, but they built in the linked action now. So you have a, a certain action you can do 
It has a little arrow going to the right and says, all right, if you if you you pay the 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 cost, which if it's a red action, you take a stress, um, you can get the second action. Some of the ships, uh, when I was able to, in in some of my inside information, when I was uh, doing some couple of interviews, um, they said that some ships will actually link into white actions, so some of the ships will be able to do to do that. One interesting thing to note is that you do have to follow the order. That is on the card. So if it, for instance, said boost link into a red barrel roll, you could not barrel roll and link into a boost. Like you have to follow the order. Um, what that does, it gives each ship by constricting what a ship can do. They actually end up opening more design space for other things because not every ship can do everything, uh, which I did find really interesting. Run. My second favorite thing, ooh, it's so tough. You know what I'm going to say? The fix on regeneration. So I got a chance to look at that um, Mm -hmm. R2-D2 card, and it looks like it comes with three charges, and you can... After you reveal your dial, you can spend a charge, gain a disarm token, which I don't know what a it's disarm a, token does. To the disarm a shield. token is the uh, weapons disabled. You can't shoot. It's the exact same thing? Yep. Okay. So that's cool. So basically, I can, if I'm reading this correctly, I can take any maneuver I want, still recover a shield, spend one of those charge tokens, but then I can't fire? Correct. That seems super fair to me. That it is it, it fantastic. Now I do have a question. We'll have to see whether whether uh, how they do it now. But I know currently, um, weapons disabled tokens all clear at the same time. Okay. Th- this would be something where I'd be curious whether they change the rule and say that they clear one at a time. So, for instance, if for some reason you were able to get two weapons disabled tokens, does it disable you for one turn or two oh, or two turns? Yeah. In order to yeah. prevent, uh, you know. Like ability stacking and shenanigans, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, but I, I really I think this is a good compromise. Regen has kind of always been the one of the banes of X Wing, and it's been there since the core set. Uh, and I think this is a fair way to represent Regen and R two D two without being too abusive. Because I mean, the ability to regen three shields, but at the right time after performing whatever maneuver, I still think it's going to be pretty powerful. Oh yeah. It, it'll still, it'll still be great. And the thing is that it's more themey, right? Cause in, in the movies when they're like, Oh, shields down, we got to fix stuff. They're not worried about shooting people. They're worried about living. Right. Right. It's and R two D two is not going to be repairing the ship for two hours. You know right. he does it. He does it when it's really needed, and that's kind of when this card is like when you really need it. Here, here's your thing because you got to be careful when you choose to regen. Now you can't just regen and then you know double tap with corn horn like you used to. Now it's like oh, if I regen, I'm not going to shoot. So you got to be careful when you do it. Hmm. I think that's a fantastic change. Something else that I really like is the redesign of the cardboard uh, chit that goes on your base. Every single ship has a back arc marked. It has a bullseye arc mark, and it has your your four notches um, in the front middle, sides middle, and the back middle. So the the bullseye no longer like the bullseye doesn't have a specified um effect it it can be changed depending on upgrade cards or certain pilot abilities or ship abilities but by adding that to every single ship they um they've built in for themselves design space like infinite design space for the future it's like all right if you have in the bullseye firing arc you can do this and they can make upgrade cards off of it, different pilots and all kinds of shenanigans by marking the back arc. They provide opportunities for different ships to add abilities out of the back arc that are now measurable because every ship has it. So it's like, Oh, if you're, 
if you're in the rear arc, like something themey, right? Like if you're if you have a ship in the back arc, you uh, you lose one agility or something like that. Like there's because they're you know they're chasing you and they're right behind you or you know all kinds of really um, like I said themey uh, abilities. I think are going to come out from being able to have all of these reference points on every single ship. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. It, it, again, like you said, it goes back to the, what we talked about earlier with having more design space. I think that is really the true genius of 2.0 is they have not designed themselves into a corner where they have to design something that is simply power creeped in order for us to want to buy it because now they have options to design things. And new ships come out and it's it's not going to be like oh i'm getting this ship to replace something you know that uh i don't need anymore now it can just be like another option Mm -hmm. will um i was looking at uh the damage deck actually uh they took out all of the randomness of fixing the uh the different crits um and it seems much more Mm -hmm. it, it I think the only one I have a problem with was the structural damage uh, that just takes one of your agility away permanently. Uh, that one's that one's really strong, and there's nothing you can do about it. But I and there's two there's two of them in the deck. Yeah, so there's oof. there's less of them, but those are those are probably the two worst for sure. Yeah, it, it seems like everything else has a way to like play around with it. Actually, I really like the the ion one. Uh, I was trying to read it here. Uh, oh, it's I don't see it now. But uh, the ion one, it gave you ions, and then until you were ionized. So uh, it's interesting on a large base ship that it actually wouldn't ionize you for three rounds. And I kind of like that uh, play. You know, you can kind of uh, decide that it's not like a, a an immediate effect. Um, has has some play to it. Dion, do you know if the ordinance cards, like I noticed they, they took concussion missiles mm-hmm. down from four power down to three. Yeah. But they kept proton torpedoes at four. Are they going, are they, is, I'm just, are they trying to bring them down so that it's more of a decision on whether to use your primary or a missile and not just better to always use a missile if you have one? Yeah, so my understanding with these missiles is they're no longer... Um, so you think about, if you ever read any of the 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 Star Wars books where they, they talk about like what the ships can do, like the idea of a ship only having, um, you know, X number of torpedoes uh, is... Is something where like, oh, it can hold like 40 torpedoes. Like, well, why can't I only shoot it once, right? So while they, they still have the limited um, use because they have the charges, what they're doing is that it just makes the attack a little bit different. You're not dis- you don't ever discard the card. You just spend the charges. So for instance, proton torpedoes, it is four dice when you get to use it, but the, the effect says that like if you want more than just this four dice attack, you have to now spend the second charge. You got to spend so a charge to use it and a charge to use the effect. So right. it's you have some extra decisions that go into using these weapons now. It's not just uh you know like you said it's not always just better to use that that torpedo or or missile. There's a there's some decisions to be made there. Um, I know that some of the um, secondary weapons are going to have uh, range bonuses. So that's going to add some more counterplay to things like turrets. Um, I know it's for sure. Uh, I know the range bonus is for sure applied to turrets. I'm not sure about any other secondary weapons right now. Uh, but something else I wanted to talk about is it's a small change, but it can, it will help with eyeballing um, future arcs better is that the arc is now a full 90 degrees. If you take a look at any of the pictures that are out there of the new cardboard chits, you notice that the 
arc actually goes from the center all the way to the corners. It doesn't have that that little uh, kind of push in where it lands on the inside of the corner. It goes all the way to the corner. So each of those triangles on your base are now 90 degrees. So just a, a small thing there, but um, it just just making again increasing the consistency there across ships. So that's cool, but that's also bad because like my eyeballs were trained to the old way. <laughs> I know, I know. That's, oh, that's gonna be learn. funny. We gotta yeah. learn. No, I think that's actually a good change, though. You know, I, I'm I'm fine with that. And um, what are so what are some other things? I mean, they've. Oh, sw- what about? Um, I was to say, what about uh, some of the changes to um, the the dials? Like, I've noticed a lot of changes to dials in the game, like the Falcon losing the hard one. Yeah. So that's the. Remember how we were talking about um, points cost being connected to abilities now. I think what we've learned in first edition is that, hey, the dial can make a huge difference. The jump master, right? The jump master still is still good simply in because X-wing. in X-Wing because of the dial. And they've nerfed it three, four times. Yeah. Right? It, it is still a viable ship because at its point cost, its dial is insane. Yeah. So just uh, something to think about there, and they've also tight. They're also tightening up a couple of rules things to bring down the power level. So let's talk about um, actions now. If you try to perform an action and you can't, you've lost the opportunity. So, uh no more Mike Jones target locks. No more. <laughs> So for those of you who don't get that reference, you see it all the time in high level play. You'll declare a target lock on something that's obviously out of range just so that you can see, you know, the distance either, you know, to, uh, to obstacles or other ships that are there in order to make you know, different decisions on repositioning or, or future maneuvers. Um, yeah, that's gone. If something is out of range, you, 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 you lost your action. And what this is going to come down to is those people who are really, really good at judging that like tip of range three, you have to really be confident because if you miss that target lock and they move into range, you now know you now have no modifiers. I absolutely love this. This is such a cool thing. And I would assume the same would go for like if you tried to to do some other action like a barrel roll and couldn't fit or yep. something like that. All of it. Every every <laughs> single action. That is phenomenal. I, I love that. Because it's like it adds a little danger, right? Mm-hmm. Like it, it it's space piloting, right? You should sometimes you gotta thread the needle, right? And it's gonna pass or fail. I, I love that. I think that's great. A couple of other things, uh, action-wise, that have been changed. You'll notice that a couple pilots now refer to green tokens. So one thing I would expect is, for instance, with uh, Wes Jansen's ability, if they transfer it over, I'm not 100% sure. Maybe it's been spoiled somewhere. I haven't seen it. But something like Wes Jansen's ability that that used to be like, you know, you remove, uh, you know, focus, evade, or target locks would now say something like, removes all green tokens which now which would include the reinforce and uh and target locks um but now we're getting some counterplay to to reinforce and how green tokens are being referred to in the game is basically now a positive modifier for yourself um to continue with that the evade action or the evade token doesn't now just add a result it simply changes one of your dice. So if you roll three evades, you can't spend an evade token. If you have a three agility, you can't spend it because it doesn't do anything. That's a great change too. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's almost like they're aware of the the bad part of allowing defensive abilities to stack up. Mm-hmm. And that's that is uh, I feel. The, a lot of the issues that we we have in the game, the things that people have considered broken, they've done a really good job of just touching on all of these 
um, all of these small pieces. Um, it's they adjusted huge. one of my pet peeves on fire control system. Yes, yes. It's not a It was like my biggest pet peeve. It was just like, oh, I take, I only have to, because the way everyone would play the card is they would like put the target lock on their ship and then their opponent's ship and they would never spend it. That way they would never forget it. That would, it would happen all the time. And I was like, oh man, you, it just, it just made the card so good for two points that you never missed your, your fire control system. Mm-hmm. But the new one, I really like it. If you have target lock of the defender, you just re-roll an attack die. That's I think that's awesome. Yeah, and it and it takes away that gray area that I know us in Gold Squadron, when we play people with a have fire control system, we say, You gotta take that t- target lock off the table because you're spending it. And you could put it back after you're done. <laughs> yeah, because I mean I would have people that would like have the target lock fixed on their ship. And then they would put the target lock down and they would literally never spend it the whole game to make sure that they couldn't forget. And I was like, eh, I mean, casual games, whatever. But in a tournament, if I got to remember, you got to remember, right? Mm-hmm. And like there, man, I'm, I'm just, I'm so excited for all these, these little changes. Something small, but big um, is the art on a lot of our staples in the game, they might have the same name, but they might have different art. So you got to make sure that you're reading the cards and they also might be using art that you thought was it had an ability with a whole new name. So for instance, um, the art for Hotshot Copilot is now the art for a card that I don't remember the name, but essentially it does what Recon Specialists used to do. Um, so just uh, here it goes. So it's now called Perceptive Copilot, and it says after you perform a focus action, gain one focus token. So it has nothing okay. to do with the old ability and old, um, you know, old, um, old, uh, the Stripping art. Of tokens. Right, exactly. It's, it's different. So <laughs> something to relearn. Make sure we're reading cards. Don't assume that they do what they do from what you, your previous knowledge. Yeah, so I saw that. Uh, or go ahead, Ram. No, no, go ahead. You, you, go uh, ahead. Oh, I was just saying that uh, I noticed that Tindob's ability, or Tindob got Key and Farlander's ability. Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, some of the abilities might be on new, new and different pilots now, which is very interesting. The real question Did they give the Y Wing an EPT? Yes. Horton gets an EPT? Get out, yep. really? Yes. I could cry right now. <laughs> That's so amazing. Thank you for the justification, FFG. Yeah. I might fly some Y Wings now. Definitely going to fly Horton Slam. Yeah. Is it just Horton or Dutch get it too? We, Let's see. We don't, or we can't see. We don't know all of them yet. Uh, all right. But there's, and then, I didn't know if they spoiled enough of them. And they, there, there are also some, uh, some new pilots in, or some old pilots in new ships. We have Nora in a Y wing now. That's part of the conversion kit, which is canon, right? She was part of the Gold Squadron. Um, yep. The attack on, uh, on, on the Death Star, um, and we have a couple of new abilities that we already talked about. You know, using the Force, like that's part of the game. But there's a couple of of new. Um, keywords, which it seems to be like something that we're starting to trend towards is, you know, these keywords mean this and, and um, it simplifies a lot of the text. Um, but one thing we see is there's a Boba Fett crew card, a new one, and it says set up, start in reserve. Like we, we don't know what that means, but we got some, right. some type of new, um, new ability stirring there. Um, you know, we got... There's a couple different tokens. Why are the surge tokens or the lightning bolt tokens red and yellow? Um, it, it's if they're exhausted or there not. You go. Oh, so there's ways to like f- maybe recharge and flip them back over. Exactly. Yeah. You. Uh, yeah. The Y wing, I believe, has a reload action, and you can put a charge on one of your weapons. Ah, that's very cool. Okay. Yeah. So it, there's there's so much coming with 2.0. 
I know I'm excited. Um, um, at Gen Con, uh, they're going to be releasing all of this, uh, all, all this new content. We're going to be, um, you know, cracking into these conversion kits as soon as we can get them. And, um, I'm, I'm just excited for the, um, like a new beginning. There's so many people who are a part of this game. One thing I do expect is when X-Wing started, like it was a cool game, but there was a lot less people who were even aware that it existed. The, yeah. the base for X-Wing is huge. And we're starting with this brand new edition that addresses a lot of the problems that a majority of people have seen in the game. I'm excited to see how how quickly it takes off and the excitement that we're going to have as a community because we're all going to go through this together. Like there's so many people in at the same time. You know what else is really exciting? The new upgrade cards, they just, they seem like they've simplified like a lot of the text on them. So they're not these like giant walls of text anymore. I'm really excited to teach new people. Like I feel like, this is a much lower barrier of entry to get into, even though there's a lot of ships. I feel like if you're a new player, you can start out with a few ships and a few upgrades and, and get to the table, especially with those cards where it's like you just play this card in this configuration and boom, you're playing the game. Like that is super awesome. Yeah. I, li- I like that. Uh, so I'm, um- Imagine just owning a core and one conversion kit. How many ships you could fly out of that conversion kit? I mean, if you don't use the model, you can essentially fly everything in that package. Um, and you can kind of decide what you actually want to purchase then from the non kind of test out ships. So uh, you won't need to proxy it as, as often. Yeah. And, and like, sec- getting to the, t- I, like, getting to the table is really easy now, right? Like you open your core set and you're a new player and there's a thing that says, all right, you play Luke's X-Wing and it has this and this on it and boom, your opponent does the same thing with theirs and you play against each other. They're almost like pre-built squads right out of the box. And those are opportunities right there for organized play and for matching uh, squad levels. It just... I really feel that FFG, you know, they took their time on this and I'm just really excited to see the, um, the after effects of their work um, because I think that uh, it's going to be really good for the game and I'm excited to see the number of people who come back into the game. And I know that there, are, there, is, uh, there is a population of people who when 2.0 was announced basically said, no, I'm out. But I think once they they you know they're on the outside looking in and seeing all the positive changes, we're going to see a lot of those people come back. I really do. Yeah, no, I th- I think so too. I think the people who kind of quit, I almost feel I don't want to say that they they had poor judgment, but maybe hasty judgment. I, I feel like just to sell your stuff for a game that you love instantly because there's change i don't know I, I i don't know if that's necessarily a great idea i don't know i think they might regret it i can tell you there's been times where i've sold stuff for my game that i hadn't played in a long time and like four years later you get the itch and you're like damn i should have sold my stuff because it's hard to find now mm-hmm. and i feel like that might luckily this isn't a collectible game, so they probably won't have that problem. But if you sold like a big collection for really cheap, it's going to cost you so much more to get back in if, if it's something that's really good. And I would, I would say that if you're someone who, who's on a budget and, um, and you come across a cheap, somebody selling a collection on the cheap, with those conversion kits, you can get an immense amount of value out of picking up somebody's collection of ships plus one conversion kit because you just get you get all these tons of pilots and the other thing um and then we're going to transition because we've been talking we've been talking about it for a while um the fact that upgrade cards are now not going to be released you know with uh, a faction restriction where it's not like if, if you're a scum only player which it does seem like they're trending to making it easier for people to be 
faction specific because that's something that a lot of people like to do that you don't have to go buy a, a an imperial ship for an upgrade for scum they're going to have the same upgrades across the factions available yeah that actually saves you money yep so yeah i mean there's there's so much to uncover. Again, I'm going to put this link in the description uh, for everybody. I'll put it on the on the YouTube posts and everything. But uh, I'm I'm extremely excited. We're still, you know, we're still we're it's May seventh right now. May, June, July, August, September. Four months away. It comes th- it comes out three days after my birthday. I wonder what I'm getting for my birthday. Hey, do we want to tease? Uh- um, our launch event. Oh yeah, of course. All right. So, um, of course, you know, one of the things that Ron is the best at is putting on awesome events. And we already had something in the chamber, um, uh, an event that we were really excited about and the launch of 2.0 just pushed us over the edge and said, all right, we got this. Take it, Ron. So, in short, we were putting together a charity event. Um, this is going to be a one-time only event. This is not something I'm doing every year. I'm not trying to compete with uh, Chad and the CAC. Um, but basically, um, my Boy Scout troop has fallen on some hard times financially due to their trailer literally falling apart. So they had to get a new one. And I decided, well... The only the one thing I can do to help is get a whole bunch of people to play X Wing and other Star Wars games together, and we'll raise a little money for charity. So we were originally going to do this over the summer, but with the announcement of 2.0, it just makes more sense to do it with the release of 2.0. So we are targeting um, September for this event. Um, I don't want to say the date yet because it's not locked in stone, but the date is going to be in September. It will be in the Chicagoland area. Um, The venue is massive. Uh, We will have plenty of space. We will live stream the X-Wing portion of this event. Um, Dion will have his own stage to be able to uh, do this. So um, if you're on the live stream, you're going to have plenty of space. No one's going to bother you. Um, Unlike the Chicago regional, we are limited in space. And sometimes you have to play really close to someone. This will not be the the, the case. Um, We will have plenty of space for people to play. Um, There's going to be food available. So uh, say you're playing X-Wing, you're like, hey, I'm, I'm pretty hungry. Um, the the Boy Scout troop is going to be working at this event, um, helping us raise money, and they'll bring you your food right to your table where you're playing. So if you're like, man, give me a hot dog, the Boy Scouts will go and get you the hot dog. You'll pay the Boy Scout. You can eat it while you're playing or whatever you want to do. Um, we're going to have a ridiculous amount of prizes. Um, this is definitely probably going to rival even our regionals as terms of price support we will be also supporting other games um we're gonna have x-wing destiny legion um, imperial assault star wars lcg and armada um all on the same day um all of the funds are going to go towards charity uh, we are going to have demo tables too if you're someone that's curious about 2.0 come here it's free learn how to play see other people play um the prizes will be based on a pod structure kind of like the cac where you'll play in pods of eight and your goal is to win your pod and then we'll do a little break and then you'll do another pod of eight and your goal will be win that pod as well um there will be a prize table the prize table is going to be um pretty good pretty good um i myself donated thousand dollars with the star wars action figures sealed in the box to this prize table um we are getting tons and tons of stuff i don't want to go too too deep right now but um if you've been to any of my events gold squadron i promise you this will be something that's going to sell out and this is going to be something that's going to be worth it and the whole team is going to pitch in to make this event 
super awesome for 2.0 and for everyone that participates and for the scouts to help them raise money um, to buy that new trailer. Yeah, it, I'm I'm super excited about it. And we're, we're doing this, you know, right after the launch of, of 2.0. Everybody's going to be fresh and uh, it's, it's going to be an exciting event. So if you want to come to one of the first major events for, uh, you know, public major events for 2.0, we're going to have it. So yeah, I'm going to be excited to dive into the data afterwards after you get like, you know, 130 people playing X-Wing with 2.0 and see what's played. Yep. And and yeah, so we're going to have the the, the the first major event for X-Wing right here. Gold Squadron, the Gold Squadron charity event for the Boy Scouts. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have a name for title, it. Title, we? title TB, TBD. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I want to thank everybody who watched live today and everybody who's listening in the future. You guys are awesome. You can always watch our live X-Wing events and content at Twitch TV slash Gold Squadron Podcast. Thank you to everyone who's taken the time to become a Twitch Prime subscriber, simply connecting your Amazon account, uh, Amazon Prime account to Twitch. You click a button, you do you get a free uh, 30-day subscription to Gold Squadron Podcast, and it basically throws $2 and change our way. It really adds up over time. So if you could take the time and do that, I really appreciate it. Um, everybody who became a patron uh, during um, during Worlds and who has you, I, I appreciate you guys so much. And I'm always trying to put that money to work um, at, at Worlds and traveling to all these events and getting you guys as much content as possible. Thank you for, uh, for all of your help. And um, you can watch all of the replays from Worlds. They'll be uploaded here over the next week or so um, to our YouTube page. Go ahead and subscribe there. Turn on notifications so you can see all the awesome content that we put out there. And, um, you know, just thank you to everybody who showed us some love uh, during Worlds in person or online. Thank you. And one thing I want to say a, a big thumbs up to everybody. Everybody who was on my stream and in the chat, um, we kept it very positive and wholesome. And I mean that word in the literal term, not sarcastically. Um, it was a really positive experience. And I had players asking me, you know, how was the chat? And, you know, I would say that the majority of the time it was extremely positive and just uh, constructive and people just having a good time. Uh, very low sodium. <laughs> <laughs> chat. So um, let's keep it that way because that's how we we have people comfortable to play on stream. So for Ron, earlier Nate, and for William, my name's Dio Morales. Gold Squadron, out. <laughs> <laughs>